Gwinnett County Public Library. Um, let's see, we've got everybody, yes. All right, my name is Gina DuVernay and I'm the Adult Services Manager for the Library and thank you for joining today's author talk. This program is being recorded and will be available um, to view on the library's YouTube channel. Today, we are honored to be joined by Kevin Adler and Donald Burns. Kevin F. Adler is an award-winning social entrepreneur, nonprofit leader, and author. Since 2014, he has served as the founder and CEO of Miracle Messages, a nonprofit organization that is dedicated to helping people experiencing homelessness, rebuild their social support systems, and financial security. Kevin's pioneering work on homelessness and relational poverty has been featured in the New York Times, Washington Post, PBS NewsHour, in his TED Talk, and elsewhere. Donald W. Burns and his wife, Lynn, are the co-founders of the Burns Institute for Poverty Research at the Colorado Center on Law and Policy, where he has served, also served as a member of their board of directors as a senior advisor to the Institute and to the center. Previously, Donald helped create the Center for Housing and Homelessness Research, formerly the Burns Center on Poverty and Homelessness at the University of Denver Graduate School of Social Work, where he also served as an adjunct faculty member and a scholar in residence. So welcome, thank you so much for being here. And- well, uh, Thank you very much for having us, Gina. Thank you, thank you. We'll just jump right in. Um, like I said, I have a few questions here and then we'll have some time for um, some questions from, from our audience. Um, now, this is for either one of you. Um, many people are under the impression that alcohol and drug use or mental illness are the primary drivers of homelessness. How do you counter these narratives in your own work? One of the important things to realize is that um, if you look at the total part of people experiencing homelessness, folks who are uh, suffering from a substance use or, uh, or some kind of uh, mental illness um, are <clears throat> a uh, experiencing homelessness. Uh, I mean, most of the states uh, exist somewhere between uh, 25 and 30 percent of <clears throat> problems with alcohol drugs, um, about five percent of some kind of a mental illness. Uh, the other things to realize is um, people don't buy this. Uh, there are many horrible who are in housing, who have serious problems with substance abuse, um, up to the like percent of the total population uh, has problems with uh, <clears throat> mental uh, illness and disability. So it's not as though these folks are really all that different from those people in housing. And the other thing to think about is what's the difference between housed people with substance abuse, mental illness, and those who are not in housing? And basically, the difference is access to um, uh, <clears throat> access to uh, resources. Uh, let me call in. Okay, it was just choppy. We could hear you, but just a little choppy. Okay. Um, yeah, and just in the meantime, that you know, it, what I can share is in terms of causes of homelessness. You know, I'm in the San Francisco Bay Area, and here about a third of people uh, surveyed who are experiencing homelessness attribute the cause of their homelessness to some kind of economic dislocation. So it could be job loss price of housing, increase in rents, uh, maybe a, a health issue that uh, has a huge price tag that they're not able to afford, an unexpected emergency. 
another third of folks uh, attribute the cause of their homelessness to some kind of relational brokenness. So that could be an argument with a loved one, uh, a death in the family, a suicide, um, a divorce, a separation. So again, I think what Don was sharing, and hopefully he'll rejoin in a moment with um, with the uh, uh, you know audio uh, a little bit easier to hear. But uh, homelessness, you, the the clearest manifestation that we see on a day to day basis is very overlapped with substance abuse, mental health issues that are untreated, but we're only seeing a fraction of the people who are actually experiencing homelessness. You know, there's a much wider percentage of folks who we don't see uh, because they're trying their best to blend in and not be seen as someone who's experiencing homelessness. Uh, and then maybe the one other piece I'd just share uh, is when we talk about substance abuse issues and even mental health issues, you know, sometimes we look at the equation as the cause of homelessness and kind of, you know, as Don was sharing, what are the numbers, what percentage of folks enter homelessness with some kind of substance abuse issue, mental health issue. Uh, but we don't talk often enough about the effect of homelessness uh, that leads to uh, substance abuse issues or mental health crisis. You know, the experience of homelessness is uh, very isolating, otherizing, uh, you know, the average life expectancy on the streets is somewhere around 50 years old. So you can just imagine all the horrific, you know, body bodily pains and the kind of emotional, you know, isolation and the psychological, you know, challenges of just being on the streets, in the elements, having everything that, you know, you're facing in society. And that leads, you know, uh, more people on the streets to turn to um, self-medicating. Uh, and, and of course, you know, the trauma of an experience like homelessness can aggravate uh, or expand upon any kind of mental health issues that maybe were tolerable before can certainly get worse. So, um, yeah, I think it's important just to think of the causal direction and the arrow in both ways. Well said, that makes a lot of sense. And you're right, it's just not something I think a ton of people just think about. Yeah. Um, Donald? Yeah. Thanks for joining us. Uh, I'm, I'm terribly sorry. Um, the other thing that uh, I would add is if you ask people who are actually experiencing homelessness, what caused the situation. Uh, substance abuse and mental illness are not at the top of the list. It's the lack of how uh, <clears throat> employment options that don't provide the kind of money that they need to pay. Um, it's divorce. It's uh, <clears throat> domestic violence. Uh, Lots of things like that. And um, they don't think of substance abuse and mental illness as the causes that are being. Indeed. Thank you. Thank you. That makes sense. Um, and we're hearing you a lot better. So thank you. <laughs> I'll move on to, the, the, to my next question. Um, so the book includes voices and stories from people who have experienced homelessness. Can you say more about who is included in the book and why it was important to include uh, first person narratives? Sure, I can begin with that one. Uh, so, you know, I've spent the last decade of my life uh, really focused on this issue of homelessness. Everything I've learned about this issue has been as a result of relationships, you know, beginning with my uncle, Mark, who lived on the streets for 30 years. And, uh, you know, really his, his, um, his meaning to me uh, as, as my favorite member of my extended family and just a beloved uncle, it was that relationship that got me even wanting to get close enough to our unhoused neighbors to hear their stories. You know, I'm, I'm a big believer in what Brian Stevenson uh, from the Equal Justice Initiative and author of Just Mercy describes as getting proximate. And I actually think you have to go further than even proximity. I think you have to get relational. So 
you know, for me, if I think about the times that my heart has been transformed uh, on certainly an issue like homelessness, but in general, it's usually because somebody I, I, I care about has a different life experience or perspective than I do. And I spend the time listening and walking in their shoes as close as I can. And so with this book, um, we knew that there'd be a lot of important uh, systems analysis on housing, income inequality, healthcare system, foster care system. Uh, we knew that there'd be an important sociological uh, perspective around what we talk about as forgotten humanity, meaning the isolation, the loneliness, the otherizing that often accompanies homelessness, the exclusion. But if you just talk about those systems, whether they're man-made government systems or human interpersonal systems, um, you miss out on what the actual lived experience is of someone enduring those broken systems. So um, it felt for me, and I think for Don and our co-authors, Amanda and Adriana, critical to be able to show each key idea concept from the experience of someone who's actually been there. And uh, I know personally, I was very inspired by Matthew Desmond's uh, work with Evicted, where I felt like a character portrayal and in, in kind of embeddedness, knowing folks, and then drawing lessons from their stories that, hey, their story actually reflects patterns in our society that we can learn from. Um, so that was for me a, a primary motive is because I think stories can change hearts and minds more than stats. Uh, but you, but putting them both together makes for a, a good book. Uh, so that was the uh, intention. That is very true. Donald, did you have a comment? Uh, I, I would just echo what Kevin has said. I mean, this book is um, one of the things about this book that really is different from a lot of the book on homelessness is the focus on uh, the humanity uh, uh, that, uh, as Kevin likes to say, um, everyone is someone's somebody. Uh, and these folks are human beings. Uh, and in order to really demonstrate that, it's important to have stories uh, about the folks uh, to demonstrate the kinds of situations they've been in uh, so that we get a better understanding of what their lives have been like. Absolutely, yes. Um, let's see. Uh, so this book is unique in that it approaches homelessness from both a person-to-person um, relational perspective and from a broader policy perspective. So you may have kind of answered this a little bit, but why is it important to incorporate both um, ways of thinking in, in this book? Yeah, I mean, I think we covered uh, some of that. What, I, what I'd maybe add, and it sounds like Don might want to add some as well, is um, one, of, one of my mentors, uh, Professor Ben Henwood at um, University of Southern California School of Social Work, uh, he read an early draft of the book and initially, some of the um, the way there felt like a more of a disconnection in the way it was laid out to him as a outside observer between humanity elements and then, then the systems elements. And he very convincingly made the case. He said, "You have to make the tie that one is not possible without the other. Uh, you cannot." advocate and fight for the policy changes that are needed. And it is, you know, a policy issue. Poverty is a policy issue. So, uh, you know, if, if we're going to make the progress on not just a living wage, but a housing wage as a nation, if we're going to uh, make the progress on perhaps raising the age at which foster care children age out of foster care, since one out of every three young people who age out of foster care experience homelessness by the time they're 26 years old, and 60% of Black young people 
will experience homelessness by the time they're 26 years old who age out of foster care. Um, if we're going to care enough about those systems and fight for and advocate and contact our elected officials and vote for candidates who you know represent change uh, in those areas, I, I think it has to come from a place of us caring enough about our unhoused neighbors as neighbors. I, I don't think we can find it in our hearts to see them as them, as the other, and then still fight for the policy changes that disproportionately hurt our unhoused neighbors. Uh, and similarly, I think from a policy lens, you know, you have to know someone by name who you want to build the policy for. Otherwise, you're just in a room whiteboarding. You know, you have to understand the stories. One of my favorite anecdotes I heard of the uh, Barack Obama during his presidency is every evening uh, he had his staff collect, I think it was seven or maybe 10 letters from all across the country. And it, sometimes they were positive, sometimes not so much, but it felt critical to President Obama to never lose sight of the people he was trying to make policy changes for, fight for every day, even if they disagreed with him. And so, uh, you know, uh, my, my view is in times in homelessness literature, uh, the books that I had come across tended to be either very academic and, and, and more policy oriented and perhaps deep diving into one or two areas of homelessness like housing or more of an activist call to action, you know, filled with tremendously powerful stories and, uh, you know, movement building, but really wanting to link the two, um, I, I felt would be the most effective and perhaps the most honest for what would be needed to, to affect change in this country. So. I couldn't agree with you more. That's what makes this great. Um, so I guess this is kind of going into this next question, um, which, which makes sense. So how does, because you touched on it, but how does um, housing insecurity disproportionately impact already marginalized people and communities? And how does it intersect with systems and forms of oppression? Uh, that's a question. Uh, and one of the things we have to realize is that uh, as you, you look at history and uh, redlining um, areas uh, and uh, even the tribe, uh, really focused on uh, white uh, returning veterans uh, and not so much on uh, veterans of, um, <clears throat> of color. Um, we have a history in this country of uh, creating uh, even greater barriers for people of color uh, in terms of housing. Uh, and that continues today. Uh, one of the really frightening statistics is that nationally, uh, although um, about 12% of the American population uh, is African-American, almost 40% of people experiencing homelessness uh, are African-American. And it's over 50% if you look at uh, mothers and children. Uh, that's simply unacceptable. Uh, and uh, I mean, this is something that we have to figure out how to address uh, more adequately. Um, and so housing insecurity uh, creates problems for everybody, but um, particularly those uh, who are people of color. Thank you. Yeah, those uh, statistics are quite alarming indeed. Um, yeah, they are. They really are. Yeah, that's, that's mind boggling. You know, just, mm -hmm. just one thing I, I think that we, that I uncovered in the book, Don, Don is, uh, a scholar of this issue for decades. So I, uh, 
I, I stand at his uh, at his heels, uh, learning from him for, for sure. He's a mentor and friend of mine. Um, but there's uh, there's some that jumped out to me that I I had not known before doing the research for this book, which is there's a puzzling statistic uh, where um, African Americans actually enter homelessness with lower levels of mental health issues lower levels of substance abuse issues and higher levels of income and earnings uh, than, than white individuals. And the rationale uh, that, uh, that you know, we, we put forward in the book is if a family system has, in the social system of which someone is coming from, has less what's we just describe as flexible capital, lex resources, support, the margin for error is that much finer. Uh, so even outside of the housing system per se, we can see the lineage of generational trauma, discrimination, racism, otherizing, marginalization in just the fact that more black people are entering homelessness than white people and those individuals are entering with more stable elements of their life than you'd expect them to based on if you were just averaging it from the average white person so i i, I wanted to just elevate that because anytime we look at one system like housing i think it's important to look at the experience of people and families are not in just one system. It's across multiple systems, multiple generations, and multiple ways of interacting that can lead to a higher likelihood of homelessness. That is that is that is fascinating, and that's why we're glad you've all done you both done this research, all of you, um, <laughs> because you know it's just not the thing that the average person knows. Um, it's very 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 interesting. Um, Let's see. There, oh, this is there was uh, in, in the book, um, and there was an, an Adam, a homeless uh, colleague of yours, Kevin, uh, says in the book, uh, "quote I never realized I was homeless when I was when I lost my housing, uh, only when I lost my family and friends." So, can you talk about uh, the twin crisis of homelessness and relational poverty and how they connect with one another? It's kind of a powerful quote. Yeah, well, it, it is a powerful quote because it it. It led me to uh, quit my job and start doing this work for the last decade. That that quote, no joke. It was, you know, I, I spent a, just for context for for listeners. I uh, spent a year trying to get to know my unhoused neighbors as neighbors. Invited twenty four individuals over the course of a year to wear GoPro cameras around their chests and basically narrate their experience of what life is like on the streets. And in one of the clips that I watched uh, from the footage, uh, the individual uh, said, as, as was quoted, I never realized I was homeless when I lost my housing, only when I lost my family and friends. So, um, you know, that that is for me, set me on this journey. Uh, the nonprofit I lead, you know, we help people who are unhoused, uh, rebuild their social support systems. Uh, we do that through family reunification services, a phone buddy program, direct cash transfers, can share a little bit more about that later if there's interest but you know just to speak about this idea of relational poverty you know we have this question that gets asked all the time um that's almost asked by some of the questions we ask even if it's not directly around this issue of homelessness and that's why are so many people experiencing homelessness right like what's the cause what's what's happening why aren't why aren't the interventions and all the money being spent and the attention seemingly moving the needle that's a really important question. Like we have to spend time talking about that. But an equally important question that just really never gets asked is with one out of every two Americans, a paycheck away from not being able to pay rent and 47% of people in the United States saying they don't know where they get $400 for an unexpected emergency. You almost have to ask, why aren't more people experiencing homelessness? Why isn't half the country homeless if, if literally half the country is a paycheck away from not paying rent? And what we're finding in our argument in the book, family, 
friends, community, church, synagogue, mosque, informal economy, relationships, social capital. So just as a starting point, I think there's a, a, a reliance on relationships, community, social capital for half the country, at least, uh, to, to get by, uh, to, to get through these tough times. So if you don't have that, or you've lost that, or your family doesn't have the economic resources much more than you do, right? They're a similar situation. And then there's a job loss or a health crisis or some kind of emergency, an injury, a falling out, an argument, a death, a separation, a divorce. Uh, the, 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 again, the margin for error, the, the, the threshold between housing relative stability or housing instability and homelessness is that much smaller. And then the experience of homelessness uh, is incredibly isolating and otherizing. Uh, one individual in the early months of the pandemic said, uh, he said, he's an unhoused individual, he said, you don't need to teach me about social distancing. That's my life already. Right. So this level of what we call relational poverty, uh, which we define as a, a total lack of nurturing relationships combined with a stigma and a shame, a stereotypes that make it really hard to form relationships. You know, if an unhoused individual uh, who's, you know, perhaps panhandling goes into uh, a church, they're never just a congregant, they're a person experiencing homelessness sitting in church, right? And, and Or they have to do whatever they can to try to blend in and hide some core part of themselves, which is also makes it difficult, you know, form relationships. So uh, we, we believe uh, that relational poverty is poverty, is an overlooked deadly form of poverty. And that, uh, you know, housing first, which is kind of a nationwide best practice model, it's, you know, it's, it, it's often thought of and, and talked about as if it was housing only. And it's not. It, it's a five principle strategy with the fifth principle being uh, social and community integration. And so we, uh, you know, at my nonprofit, that's the focus of our work. Uh, but in this book, we felt it was important to um, start with these conversations around relational poverty, otherizing rugged individualism, exclusion, uh, and stigma, because oftentimes that's an afterthought around homelessness. But I think for our unhoused neighbors, it's one of the prevailing experiences, just as much as the loss and the lack of stable housing. Wow. Uh, oh, go ahead, Donald. <clears throat> and Gina, I wanted to uh, pick up on um, the relational poverty because uh, yes, uh, Kevin's absolutely right. Uh, folks experiencing homelessness uh, tend not to have the kinds of uh, networks of support that they need. But I would argue that relational poverty goes the other way also, that many of us in our attitudes about people experiencing homelessness in fact, have a very poor relationship with those experiencing homelessness. So there is a kind of relational poverty there also. Uh, and as Kevin suggested earlier, uh, if we're going to create the kinds of changes we really need to see happen in order to address this problem adequately, we have got to get people to shift gears in their thinking. Um, there is a basic xenophobia that all of us have about people who are different. And we've got to overcome that. These folks uh, are not so different from us. They really are our brothers, our sisters, our fathers, our mothers. Uh, our aunts, our uncles, um, and we have to treat them that way. I mean, can you imagine treating uh, an uncle uh, and ignoring them, 
uh, otherizing them and saying, you're not worthy of help. Uh, that's, you know, we wouldn't do that to our relatives. Uh, and so we have got to shift gears in our thinking about how we think about how we feel about folks experiencing homelessness. And our failure to do so is a kind of relational poverty. That's a perfect example um, and a good, you know, sort of analogy that, you know, bringing it very close to you in terms of would we treat our family members that way? And most That's people right. know, yeah. Um, I did find it interesting, though, I don't think, I've, at least I don't typically think about homeless people homeless people hiding you're, you're saying some hide and i would imagine that would be even more difficult um because i guess you know with that the, with the hiding would that prevent you from seeking help what is uh, that it's all difficult but it seems like that might even be more difficult is absolutely that... and and one of the uh i have a, a very good friend and and uh colleague uh who uh came from a very very good family in texas she ended up in denver uh worked for me uh for a while uh when i ran out of money i i had to lay her off uh i did help her find another job but during uh, her, some of her time in Denver, she was experiencing homelessness uh, for almost two years. Uh, she was living in a shelter. She was ashamed, so ashamed of her situation that she refused to tell her family, all of whom could have helped her considerably. And she was just too ashamed uh, to admit to her family that she was experiencing homelessness. And the reason she experienced homelessness was because uh, somebody made a mistake on uh, a form about her uh, uh, military status, and she didn't get the kind of support that she was expecting to finish up her degree. Uh, and so she literally... I mean, she was a an aide to a state legislator. She was an aide to the governor's office. Nobody knew that she was experiencing homelessness because she was ashamed of it. Um, that's the kind of shame that some people experience, uh, and it's it's just awful, just awful. Yeah, that's truly heartbreaking, but it's understandable. I I yes, I, I, I just I can think of a ton of people, myself included, maybe that might do the same thing. And it's it's heartbreaking. Yeah, it is. Um well we are, you know, coming to a close here, but I have some other questions here, but I, I, I'll see what, how many I can sneak in in the next few minutes. <laughs> um, well, you, you talked about that, you know, one out of every two Americans is a paycheck away from not being able to afford, uh, afford rent. Um, and I think you've touched on this, but I'll go ahead and ask. So what does that say about uh, who is housing insecure today in America? Well, half the country, all right. of us, right? <laughs> yeah, and and I think it's um, uh, it's important to note that as you just did, because again, part of the argument in the book that we're putting forward is we've created this binary between the homeless and I guess the housed, right? Which if you're not the homeless, you're House, we, we would never talk about ourselves in that way because it's kind of a ridiculous uh, category. You know, uh, there's a wide spectrum from folks who are, you know, own multiple homes to folks who are insecurely housed, barely getting by, you know, extremely rent burdened. But that's kind of what we've done is we've clumped everyone together into the homeless. And, and so we try to 
talk about homelessness and housing security less of a binary and more of a spectrum, right? It's not a black or white, yes or no, you know, zero or one. It's really much more about, well, you know, how rent burdened are you? Uh, you know, how, what, what's your stability in terms of earnings and income? Uh, what's, you know, the kind of rental market look like? Do you have family support if need be? Uh, so I think homelessness is actually much closer to many of our experiences than we realize. And in fact, in the book, we make the case from running the numbers that the number of people experiencing homelessness over the course of a year in the United States is probably closer to about 6 million people, uh, 6 million, which I believe two and a half million are children, you know, under the age of 18. Uh, so uh, it's, you know, if you're starting to talk about nearly 2% of the population uh, in the United States who experience homelessness uh, throughout at some point over the course of the year, uh, and then if you broaden that to who's potentially one paycheck away, two paychecks away, one injury, one job loss, one, you know, separation away, uh, it, it starts looking a lot more like, you know, all of us or, you know, many of us in this country. So. I do want to go ahead. This was this was my um, well. Before I ask my final question, because we have time, you did speak about your your uncle, and I just wanted to see um, if you could tell us a little bit more about him and the role that he continues to play in your activism. Yeah, absolutely. You know, uh, my uncle. Um, every year he was on the streets. He sent me a, a birthday card. Never missed a never missed a birthday. Every single year. Um, you know, he, uh, was always our guest of honor Thanksgiving and Christmas. Um, you know, I, 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 I don't think I've shared this before, but I was given a talk the other day and, um, you know, I have a photo of him and I, when I was younger and, you know, I've always just looked at his face in the photo and, you know, big smile with my grandparents and my mom and brother. And it was the first time in uh, in all those years I've looked at that photo thousands of times, probably at this point, um, that I actually looked at his hands, and you could see his hands were kind of ballooned up, sw swollen, out of it looks like a few, you know, abscesses, cuts on them, and uh, he he lived an entire life away from our family dinner table that I was not aware of, that I didn't see, that I didn't understand. And, uh, you know, I wish I would, had had a chance as an adult to get to know my uncle a little bit better, to ask him some of the questions that I've asked my unhoused neighbors. But in some ways, I'm also grateful that I never thought of Uncle Mark as a homeless man. You know, he was just a beloved member of my family, because that relationship as a starting point for me is informed what we need to all do on this issue, which is we need to know someone not as a problem to be solved, but as a person to be loved, as whether it's our aunt or uncle, mom or dad, brother or sister, son or daughter, friend or classmate, or seeing that person as someone else's somebody. Um, but yeah, he was very significant for me and it was truly an honor to be able to uh, have our book released uh, last month within one week of what would have been his 70th birthday. So. That's great. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, Donald, I don't know if you can hear me. Yes. Uh, I am so sorry. It's okay, but you were going to give us a, an interesting statistic. Do you recall what that was? Yes. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, yes, we yes. can hear you just fine now, Don. Um, the housing wage nationally is about eight dollars an hour, and that is uh, what you have to earn on a monthly basis before an average, average two bedroom housing unit. Our minimum wage nationally is $7.25. And 
there is no state in the country where the minimum wage is enough to afford a an average two bedroom housing wage. Uh, and there are only one percent of the county in the country are there uh, is the minimum wage enough to afford a one bedroom housing unit. Something is wrong with that. Uh, that just doesn't provide a living wage. And, uh, you know, you talk about housing insecurity. I mean, that sort of sums it up. Absolutely, it does. It's not adding up, for sure. No, it doesn't add up. Don, we can see you, we can hear you, it's great. Uh, well, I'm so sorry. Uh, <laughs> the uh, No, it's okay. It happens. It happens. But I do have one final question um, for, for either one of you. Um, so we'll end on this question. What do you say to someone who wants to get involved in solving the homelessness crisis, but feels daunted by the size of the problem or ashamed, as we talked about? For not getting involved sooner, um, where where do you suggest they begin? Uh, there are lots of things that a person can do. Uh, one of the important things is get to know somebody who is experiencing uh, the experience of relating to someone. The, is frankly transformative. Uh, your eyes will be open. Uh, your heart will be open. Uh, another thing is, um, you know, become more familiar with the problem and then speak out when friends, neighbors, whatever, uh, in negative terms uh, about the issue. Uh, correct people. Uh, say, you know, that really is wrong. Uh, and he uh, all of the information, you know. Um, in terms of church group, uh, your um, community, um, have <clears throat> uh, meetings, uh, have community uh, gatherings where you can talk honest openly about the issue and correct all of the uh, misinformation and disinformation we have uh, about the issue and then uh, you know uh, talk to your elected officials uh, they're the ones who make decisions uh, tell them uh, you know you've got to stop criminalizing homelessness let's try and do something positive and constructive Thank you so much. Everything you said is actually doable for us all. So thank you for providing that information. Um, Kevin, did you have anything else to add? Yeah, the one thing I'd add is that, oh, uh, the, yeah, the one thing I'd add is that uh, we uh, at Miracle Messages have a, a phone buddy program uh, where you can get matched with a neighbor experiencing homelessness for weekly phone calls and text messages. And uh, that one-to-one uh, -one relationship, 30 minutes a week, all phone calls, all text messages, we do training, support, uh, weekly orientations, check-ins, there's a call log, we give you a phone number through a partnership with Dialpad, Google Voice, so you don't need to uh, use your own device phone number if you're not comfortable with that. So yeah, I would just uh, invite folks if they're interested uh, to uh, sign up at miraclemessages.org. I see that that was just put in the chat um, because we we're, we're have right now a wait list of unhoused neighbors looking for volunteers. Um, so we'd love to have more volunteers come from anywhere in the country, 20 minutes, 30 minutes a week. You're just meant to be a friend, not a caseworker, a social worker, just, just a good neighbor to an unhoused neighbor. That is also something we can all do. Yes, it is. Yeah, <laughs> I do it. I got my miracle friend. 
<laughs> That's great. Yeah. Thank you so much. This was very enlightening. Um, and and Don, thanks for you know keeping keeping the, your stamina up in, in terms of coming back in to join us. But um I really appreciate well, thank you again. Um we we caught all the important bits, uh, Donald. So thank you so much again. And thank you, Kevin. And um, uh, I really appreciate you. We we don't have any questions because we're run, we've are we run out of time. So we will end here um, and uh, we'll um, share this video once it, once it's, it's all edited and good to go. Thank you for having us. And thanks for your kind heart and uh, having this conversation today. So absolutely. Thank you. Taking a look at our book. You did your homework. I can tell. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for doing this important work. Yeah. Yes. All right. Have a All great right. Take care now. Bye. Bye.